Right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Meet the Authors, Dr. Frederick Gooding Jr. with Dr. Sylviane Greensward and Mr. Marcellus Perkins. My name is Diane, and I work at the Johnson County Library, and I have the honor of introducing this evening's speakers. Before beginning, I want to remind you all that Dr. Gooding will be presenting a workshop this Saturday morning from 9 to 11 on Zoom on how to rightly write about race when afraid to say the wrong thing. You can register for the workshop on the library's website on the events page. For this evening's program, my colleague Amanda and I will be monitoring the Q&A, and there will be time at the end to answer questions. And now to our speakers. Dr. Frederick Gooding Jr. is the Dr. Ronald E. Moore Endowed Professorship at Humanities at Texas Christian University and concentrates on globalized American pop culture. He served as the 2021 Leonard A. Lauder Visiting Senior Fellow for the National Gallery of Art in Washington, DC, for which he has a forthcoming book about the value and invisibility of black statue statues in the nation's capital. His most recent publication provides groundbreaking research on a vital yet underappreciated workforce with Public Workers in Service of America. Dr. Sylviane Greensward graduated with a Master of Arts in Liberal Arts in African and African American Studies from Louisiana State University in 2006. She later obtained a PhD in Geography and Anthropology from LSU in 2017. She is the former supervisor of archival research and the former director of the Race and Reconciliation Initiatives Oral History Project at Texas Christian University. Presently, she's an assistant professor of professional practice at TCU's John V. Roach Honors College, where she teaches cultural studies courses such as Africa Through Film, Anthropology of Black Panther, and Francophone Blackness. Mr. Marcellus Perkins completed his undergraduate education at the College of the Holy Cross. He graduated with his Master's of Higher Education from Texas Christian University. He has served as Program Coordinator for Professional Development in TCU's Student Athlete Development Department, Graduate Research Assistant for the Race and Reconciliation Initiative, Intern for the Critical Race and Ethnic Studies Department, and Representative of the College of Education for the Graduate School Senate. Perkins is currently a Graduate Assistant in the Office of the Chancellor and President, where he finished up his doctorate program, co-author of A History to Remember, TCU Purple, White, and Black, and Chair of TCU's Portrait Project. Perkins is a former basketball player for the Holy Cross Crusaders and a current doctoral student at TCU in the Higher Education Leadership. And now please join me in welcoming our speakers. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for that rousing introduction. It is a pleasure to touch base with all of you all and share a little bit about what we've written and hopefully what we've learned in the process when coming together. And so what I'd like to do at the very beginning is not only introduce myself, but also introduce the project as a brief overview. Then I'll allow each of my other co-authors to introduce themselves. We have a couple of slides and a brief video that we like to share with you all. And hopefully this material will generate some questions by which we can interact uh, towards the end of the program. So if you notice on the background of Dr. Sylvia Greensward's um, um, well, her background, uh, uh, her backdrop, uh, and also the t-shirts that Mr. Perkins and I bo both have, um, they, they have this abstract uh, type design. And I would like to start by stating that this design is an abstraction of one of the centralized iconic features of our campus, which is Texas Christian University located in Fort Worth, Texas, 30 miles about west of Dallas. So there's this fountain that is iconic, it's called Frog Fountain. And as you notice, there are four different plumes that represent the four different stages that a student would matriculate through, right? And obviously the, the largest one is the, the biggest one, um, you know, representing this idea that the water continues to flow and this constant cycling of knowledge and information. So TCU is a university just like many others that is designed to foster education and learning experiences. So in terms of how do we end up here with this book that we're talking about? Well, allow us to dial way back to 2020. If you all recall, we haven't heard this person's name in the news a lot lately, but there's a gentleman by the name of George Floyd, who we all witnessed in horror lose his life in a nonsensical manner. The gentleman should be alive today period. And so that moment, I think along with many other moments, because at least in the Dallas area, Botham John lost his life. 
eating ice cream in his own apartment. Atiana Jefferson lost her life playing video games with her nephew. Sandra Bland lost her life. So there are numerous cases, but I think with the George Floyd piece, it really crystallized this idea that we still have some work to do. So Texas Christian University, along with many other institutions across the nation, decided that it was time to reconcile. And what do I mean? What do I mean is that the Board of Trustees created an institution called the Race and Reconciliation Initiative that was charged with studying TCU's relationship with slavery, racism, and the Confederacy. As a result, I was named chair of this initiative. And the first thing I did was try to assemble a team of individuals who are willing to do the work. And as you see on your screen, these two individuals absolutely helped breathe life into this initiative and what helped make it so successful today. And so even though I'm no longer chair, we're proud to say that the initiative is still ongoing. It is in year, is it year four, y'all? Year four, okay. So uh, I was chair for the first two years. I sent his fourth year. And now we start to see the fruits of the seeds that we planted many years ago. One of the fruits, um, Mr. Perkins, not to mute you, but would you mind muting your screen real quick so we can see the, the, the picture of the book? And one of the fruits of all of our research is the book you see here. So here's a cover of the book, and I just want to explain it really quickly. It's called A History to Remember, TCU in Purple, White, and Black. And as you see, the first panel up in the left-hand corner, right, going top to bottom is purple, right? And then you have on the second, because uh, there's three rows. In the second row, you have a white panel. And then in the third row, you have a black panel, right? So that's purple, white, and black, because purple and white are our school colors. Right. And also what's significant about the three photographs that you see is that they also represent different eras in time. Right. Because I think one of the misnomers that we wanted to address in creating this book was that African-American history didn't just begin during the integration period. The footprint and the thumbprint of African-Americans were around since the very inception right, of TCU's story. And this is something that Dr. Greensward will talk about more in depth. And so you have a picture from the early days, right, during the founding period, right? Then you have a picture during that famous integration period, and you can see the, uh, the look on the face of the, uh, the white female about, hey, is this integration thing really happening? And then you have a picture from the more modern era, right? Uh, although the 90s are, I think, slowly, uh, you know, losing that status of being considered modern, you know, unfortunately, unfortunately, okay. But some of us remember it like it was yesterday, okay? All right. So... Rex Perkins, you can join the cipher again. So, so that's the, the book, right? And I, I think um, what Mr. Perkins will talk about as well is this is a highly unusual project. The idea that we work at a predominantly white institution and by deciding to tell our history and tell it boldly and accurately, it now continues to live as a book product that we um, absolutely are excited to, to share. And again, going back to what I was saying earlier, being the fact that we are a university, we are precisely in the exact place and time where this should be encouraged and fostered as far as us telling the history of our institution. So with that being said, I would love to have uh, our, my other co-authors uh, because again, I think what's important is co-authors, right? Um, even though, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, I, I was in this position as chair, I, I still thought it was so very important with respect to knowledge creation that we share in the production of knowledge. Because one of the pieces I'm gonna say at the very beginning, um, and we've experienced this already in, in the many times that we presented the book, is that at your local library, any library can, it can any librarian can attest that most books written about the African-American experience are actually not written by African-Americans themselves, right? And so I think with this project, what we're also doing is not just highlighting and, and showcasing stories that are, are perhaps not known or you know may, maybe weren't told enough, but we're also highlighting our own voices as African Americans who are connected or Africans who are connected to the Black experience and are able to produce our own voice. So it may sound different, it may land different, and by design, it should. 
Our perspective is unique, but one that is nonetheless valuable and absolutely contributes to the overall conversation. So we never profess to say that this is the end or um, of, of the conversation. If anything, this is the beginning of a conversation that will only continue to grow and develop as more people hopefully are inspired to add on to what we've discovered with respect to Black history at TCU. So with that being said, Dr. Greensward, uh, why don't you um, kick us off in terms of um, you know the, the, the early years and what you found in introducing yourself and also maybe a little bit about what inspired you to also um, you know stay uh, so involved and dedicated to this project that you absolutely um, shined your light upon. Yeah, so I I started off as a as a researcher. I was hired to do research exclusively um, back in 2020. I started off as a postdoctoral fellow, and um, I was hired to conduct ethnographic work and to also work with the archives. So I was working from that little cubicle in the library, which is great because that's where I love to be, um, and I was looking at documents that would help shed light, especially on the first few years of TCU's existence. And um, it was it was quite a journey. Uh, I didn't really know what I was looking for. It's kind of like walking in the dark and, and making up what the room looks like as you walk through, um, through the room. And so Eventually, one of the things that really helped kickstart um, this project in terms of my archival research uh, and also the oral history project is the fact that TCU is a member of the, a, a consortium called University Studying Slavery. Uh, this is a group of universities throughout the country and beyond uh, that have taken the task to research their own history and the affiliation of their own institutions with the institution of slavery. Um, so TCU being part of that allowed us to make some um, wonderful connections. Um, and especially in terms of dealing with what we call slave descendant communities. Um, I didn't really know how to approach the research process in a, in a human way, in a really, in a, in a personal, um, personal and personable type of approach because I'm an ethnographer. So I'm really interested in finding people's voices. And whenever we're dealing with documents that are, you know, 100 years old, 150 years old, it's kind of hard to have a personal relationship with those people. So I really made it my task to look at slave descendant communities and try to look at the families of enslaved individuals and how those descendants are living their life today, how their descendants are experiencing the legacy of the institution and how that changes their relationship with higher education overall. So should I get started on our slides? All righty, so I'm going to share um, what we've been working on. And while Dr. Grinsford pulls up the slideshow, um... You know, I'm an absent-minded professor, so I do forget some of these pieces, but she's absolutely correct in that uh, one of the first things that we did do was join universities studying slavery. Um, um, and I think when you talk about libraries and books, right, uh, one of the key pieces that was helpful for us, right, was I, I got everyone a copy of the book, uh, Ebony and Ivy um, by Craig Walder. And um, I think this, this was at the forefront of... Of, of this idea of universities acknowledging their relationship. And since that time, um, Ruth Simmons, uh, who was formerly uh, you know, president or chair of, of Brown University and then went to just retired from Prairie View, she started this idea of at an Ivy League institution, Brown saying, you know what, um, we may have been involved and they were um, because uh, proceeds uh, to help build a university were from enslavement, right? And so acknowledging that connection, I think was so very important. Uh, it's embarrassing. It can be um, very difficult, but other universities started to follow suit. I mean, some uh, with uh, schools such as Georgetown even talking about um, potential reparations plans as a result. So uh, it was very helpful to know that we were part of a community of other scholars that were engaging in this um, type of work. Um, but that being said, we still uh, are excited to share ways in which 
um, our research is unique. But so that being said, Dr. Green, so what you got? I'm going to read um, our land acknowledgement before we get started on the details of the book. TCU acknowledges the many benefits, responsibilities, and relationships of being in this place, which we share with all living beings. We respectfully acknowledge all Native American peoples who have lived on this land since time immemorial. TCU especially acknowledges and pays respect to the Wichita and affiliated tribes upon whose historic whose historical homeland a university is located. So welcome to A History to Remember. We will tell you the story of TCU in purple and white, which is the one that you probably know, but we're adding a shade of black to the presentation, uh, telling you about the history that unfortunately has not often, often been told, at least not in its entirety. Um, a lot of the information that you will find in this book comes from an oral history project, which Dr. G um, kind of came up with in order to be able to gather the voices of the people who actually live the history. And that's one thing that makes this book a little bit different from other traditional history books, is that we are collecting the living history of the people who have lived to see use Black history. So it's not just in the past, but these are actual living legend, history-making people who are still there to tell their story. So it's not just a history book, but it is a story. TCU integrated its main campus in 1964. The unanimous vote by the student congress to send to the trustees that we need to racially integrate now. 56 years later, students still voice their concerns regarding racial discrimination on campus. The Oral History Project is a new way to interpret and understand TCU's rich and complex history. Most of what we know of the African American experience is told through white voices. Then what does that say about the people who actually had the experience? There is another side to every story. I emailed him one day and said, if you're really serious about what you're saying, we need to have a meeting. 2016 marked a shift as students expressed growing frustrations over the lack of Black representation. Well, like, this is a little weird. I, I wasn't used to that in my classes. And it occurred to me that every time a Black student probably walked into a room, that's how they felt at TCU. Like, they were usually the only person that looked like them. I was like, hmm, I want to shake things up. And if it comes down to it, I would get arrested, like, for the cause. Though TCU has publicly promoted diversity, we still have a long way to go. And so what I'm trying to do is set a tone. And my tone on this whole race thing is that there's room at the table for everybody. In 2000, being 4% Black and 84% Caucasian, TCU did not meet the 17% minority quota for diversity. And I think for African-American students, it was 200, maybe 200 plus. So it was small enough to where we knew everyone. In 1990, thanks to the tireless efforts of Michelle Smith, Dr. Linda Moore, and student athletes, TCU adopted Martin Luther King's Day as a campus walk holiday. The, the athletes knew it, they know it. They're not blind. In 1980, TCU's first, though short-lived, interracial fraternity, Tai Chi Epsilon, was born. Relived the inception of Black student activism. Discover success stories like Dr. Jennifer Giddings Brooks, first Black this TCU, and Dr. James Cash, first Black TCU student athlete. Uh, that it would be fitting to erect a statue of Dr. Cash in front of Schulmeyer Arena. That... Uncover mysteries. So seeing how these students left, never to return, what we're asking is, what happened to them? And what possibly can make them not want to ever return?
They just decided they were going to do this and brought five black kids on campus. Um, the atmosphere was not welcoming. Was not welcoming. Understand the cause of integration is the story of Dr. Ron Hurdle, first black cheerleader at TCU. You know, Ronnie was treated so poorly. I look back on this. Hmm. Sorry. Oh, but, you know, we, we never thought of anything like this. We, we were just trying to do what we thought we should do. And you hit it on the head that, you know, now is the time for everybody to do what they can where they are. And get the whole untold, unmuted story. So who then would counter uh, something that was, you know, democratically established? Uh, who are they? Because we always say they do. <laughs> it, it was... Uh, it was time to reconcile that. We need to retrace our steps. Stay tuned. So we're going to share very briefly some insights on some of our portions of the book, uh, and then there will be time for questions after the presentation. Starting with the humble beginnings, TCU founded in uh, 1873. So this is an institution that was founded after the Civil War. So as opposed to some other institutions in the United States, it's not an institution that benefited directly from slavery. But as we explore in the book, we know that the people who founded the school were actually uh, slave owners and also involved uh, in the Federacy fighting on the cause of the Federacy, the Confederacy. We know that the town in which TCU was built back in uh, the late 19th century was actually built on the back of enslaved individuals and also a population of indentured servants that we, uh, according to folklore, came from Italy. So we know that the town was founded on the labor of enslaved individuals. We also know that the people who built the first TCU building were enslaved individuals and indentured servants. So TCU, although was not built on slave labor, it benefited from the labor of enslaved individual. The one person that we were able to um, locate in the archives is a man by the name of Charles Thorpes. He went by Charlie Thorpe, along with his wife, Kate. They. Um, produced a lot of labor. They worked tirelessly for the community of Thorpe Spring where TCU was first located, but also for the college in itself. Uh, their labor was beneficial to the entire student population. However, the appreciation of their labor was not recognized until very recently. Uh, looking at the archive, we have been able to found evidence that racist um, acts were taking place on campus on the regular. And if you look at the photograph that is at the top, um, the top photograph, you're going to see that there is uh, a black woman on this in the side of the building. And as you can clearly see through proxemics, um, her location indicate that there definitely was a marginalization of the population of uh, domestic workers and janitorial worker on campus. Uh, more details found in uh, different accounts, letters, diaries, give um, very uncomfortable truth about the treatment of these individuals on campus. And we also know that the tradition of keeping African-American uh, servants on campus is a tradition that lasted way until the 1930s. So the photograph that you see at the bottom is an actual map of the campus from 1930. And you notice that there is a building that was called Servant's House. So there was a building located right next to the stables where um, the janitorial crew would reside. And they were 
they are actually listed as lodgers on the census of that day. Uh, so moving on to the next section, uh, Mr. Perkins, can you also tell us how you came to work on this project and also elaborate on the community aspect that is covered in the book? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Dr. Greenswood. Um, so when I came to TCU, I came as a master's student and I was actually working in a student athlete development. And uh, Dr. G gave me a call one day and asked, did I really want to make real change on campus? And not knowing what that meant and what direction we were heading in, uh, I trusted the leadership and I trusted the vision and decided to commit fully to the Race and Reconciliation Initiative. And while doing this work, I found that uh, when you begin research, not only do you learn a lot about the world around you, but you learn a lot about yourself. And, and what really piqued my interest or really allowed me to kind of find my place was me honing into my own curiosities. Uh, for me, curiosity is care. And then once I began to look in the archives and look at names, dates, and pictures, I really began to care about what is the story that TCU tells itself about itself? But in that, what story is also being excluded? And a lot of times when we have uh, these institutions, they, they sometimes separate themselves from the local communities. Uh, you have where TCU exists and then you have where Fort Worth exists. Now, honestly, that, that doesn't make sense because TCU is in the city of Fort Worth. But when you talk to local Fort Worth residents, particularly from the black neighborhoods such as Como, Historic Southside, Morningside, Hillside, Stop 6, they felt as if that was not a place for them for a very long time. And even today, there are people that have some apprehensions about coming over to Westbury University Drive. And so when I began to think about what does community look like and what does TCU's relationship to community look like from a historical sense, one of the things that I wanted to explore is TCU's relationship to Black education. And so one of the things that really, really piqued my interest as we were doing our campus tours one day, I started to look at different building names. I stopped at Jarvis Hall, not knowing much about Jarvis Hall or the Jar Jarvis family, but I knew it was very popular especially in North Texas. There's Jarvis Elementary Schools, Jarvis County. So I knew that the name had some type of relevancy to the study. And so every time I typed in Jarvis Hall, Jarvis Christian College at the time kept popping up. Now it's Jarvis Christian University. And so what I wanted to inquire was, well, what is TCU's relationship? We have a Jarvis Hall here on campus. What might be the relationship with Jarvis Christian University? And so just for background, the Jarvis family, James Jarvis, uh, he was a general in the Confederate Army, and his wife, Ida Van Zant Jarvis, also came from wealth and as well as an enslaved owning background with her family members. And so this, these two families, they, they came from money, they came from prestige status, and they had a lot of influence. And so one thing I, that came across in my research was that TCU had a very, very interesting, complicated, nuanced relationship with this HBCU. And my question was, well, two individuals who once owned slaves fought for the Confederacy. Why do they care about Black education after emancipation? And so that led me down this long rabbit hole of trying to find the right questions and possibly the right answers to my right questions. And so what I came across was that during the 20th century, uh, when a lot of HBCUs were being developed, uh, the, the Jarvis family, TCU and Disciples of Christ Church also got involved in finding benefits in that if they had a black college that also was in the state of Texas, that also was a part of the Disciples of Christ Church, it was a way to one, yes, educate black people, but two, creatively get around this idea of mixing the races, what is something will be, be known as separate but equal, but I call it separate but unequal. And so the influence during that time of the Jarvis family uh, was exponential to the point that Ida Van Zant Jarvis had handpicked the first president of Jarvis. His name was J.N. Irvin, which they referred to as the Booger T. Washington of Texas. And for those that are familiar with that type of name in history, Booger T. Washington was known as the most influential Black person in America during the 20th century because of his support and influence on education and race matters. He pushed an industrial-based education from his alma mater of Hampton Institute, as well as the school he started, Tuskegee Institute, that promoted industrial learning, political passivity, 
and black people not really being in par part of the civic process. And so because of these very um, prominent features of his education uh, that he was promoting, Ida Van Zandt Jarvis called him uh, the perfect combination of Booker T. Washington and Randolph Clark. Randolph Clark uh, was a co-founder of TCU. And so with that, uh, we find in my research that uh, over the course of the 20th century, uh, Jarvis had always been in the shadows of TCU. Uh, and this newspaper clipping you have here, uh, this is in 1912, and Ida Van Zandt Jarvis goes to visit the campus. She says that it is a memorial to her loving and faithful slaves. Now, it is very paternalistic in tone and very, again, complicated. Here you are being involved in donating almost 500 acres to start an HBCU, but you speak of it in a tone that is very uh, misconstrued and misguided that your slaves loved you and were so faithful, as opposed to looking at the larger system that you have benefited from by having enslaved people work and live and serve to your every needs. And so in that earlier time, when Jarvis starts, we, we have this very uh, complicated relationship where Ida Van Zandt Jarvis, Cyprus of Christ Church and TCU are influencing the curriculum, the land, the leadership. Uh, and then to later during the civil rights era, uh, there's another interesting thing that actually happens during this time when TCU decides to desegregate. Two months later, they adopt Jarvis to be a college of TCU. And again, the, the same question remains is like, why are you so involved into black education now when black people have always been in the presence of TCU, always been in the state of Texas, always been members of the Disciples of Christ Church? Well, in my research, what I'm finding is that a lot of time power structures, white power structures at that will do something but for black people, quote unquote, but they will be the ultimate benefactors. Uh, in critical race theory, they call that entrance convergence. And so a lot of what we have here in this community piece that TCU is doing during this time is an act of entrance convergence. And so I'll let Dr. G speak a little bit more on what happens during the integration period of TCU. But please note, in March of 1964, Jarvis becomes a college of TCU. And Dr. G will tell you what happened two months before that. Dr. G. Absolutely. Thank you, Mr. Perkins. And so moving on to the next slide, what we want to uh, allow the history to do is to show us just how complicated things can be. I mean, oftentimes when we um, recount an incident that happened in the past, we, we essentialize, we only use a few sentences, and oftentimes it may not be quite descriptive of all the nuance that's involved. So to say, oh, we integrated, you know, in, in, in two two words, right? is a, a true statement, but maybe what is not in, encapsulated in just two words that we integrated is exactly in what manner and what that really looked like. So what do I mean? In January of 1964, from this day henceforth starts this really eloquently worded memo that proclaims that TCU will no longer be segregated because here's what's complicated. As my colleagues were mentioning to you, um, TCU, when it started in 1873, in many ways was avant-garde. It was quite progressive in that, if you can imagine, it was co-ed, <laughs> right? So this was deemed progressive at the time, right? Um, the idea is one of the few institutions west of the Mississippi that had both male and female students, right? That's what I mean. So in many ways, that's thumbs up. Right, we're, we're ahead of the curve here. But at the same time, for nearly two thirds of its existence, it was racially segregated, right? At least when it comes to African-Americans. And I think what's also fascinating is how we did see instances of people of color, but but that goes along this larger complicated, you know, um, uh, equation as to you know, who qualifies as, you know, as, as, as being close to being visually identifiable as African-American, because that's where the rubber hits the road, right? So um, as you see on your screen here, um, or, you know, this is a page lifted from our library, whereby um, we're documenting the fact that this barrier was lifted, okay? So that is a true story. But here's what happens when you read the fine print, so to speak, right? And you dig a little bit deeper in the archives. In the same memorandum that allows 
right? Allows, I, I don't know if I like using that verb, but for the same memorandum that 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 is looking to integrate, right? From a racial standpoint, right? Uh, Doc, if you can hit the, um, uh, the next slide. Or just, yeah, yeah, okay. So in the, in the same one, what we have is, um, uh, if you click again, in the same memo, we actually have language that does a couple of things. We have language that actually increases the admission requirements, right? And, and if you click again, at the same time, the, the, the same memorandum says we're gonna integrate, you increase admission standards, and then they decided to raise the amount of tuition, right? The cost of tuition, right? And then thirdly, uh, along the lines of what uh, Mr. Perkins was saying, they, they theorized you know, in the memo. So again, just to show you what the, the intent right, of the Board of Trustees was at the time, this idea of, well, because um, you know, we're a mostly white institution, many Black people won't want to come here anyway, right? So in other words, we have to question ourselves or question them about the sincerity of their diversity, right? Because on one level, we say we integrate it, fact. But at the same time, I think it's appropriate for us to ask questions as to, well, what was the, the quality of this integration of, of this methodology and how sincere were they in, you know, in promulgating this diversity? Because if you say that you're going to open up the door, did you merely unlock it, right? Because again, if I'm driving down your street um, you know, and your door is closed, but unlocked, I, I still might, you know, keep, keep going and not, not really realize that, you know, th that the door is open. But if you're telling me, no, I'm having a barbecue, I want you to come over. How many times have y'all gone to a party, right, where everyone's out back and what do they do? They actually leave the door open, right? Or they have some balloons and to signify, no, just come on in back, you're welcome, right? So in other words, the door was unlocked as far as uh, no barriers to integration, but at the same time, when you raise the admission standards and raise tuition, and then in the same memo are saying, well, you know, we don't really think black people are going to attend here anyway. The question is, is the door really open? So next slide. The point in all this is not to necessarily embarrass uh, the university and shame, shame, shame and point fingers. The point is for us to understand how complicated a uh, history can be and how um, you know, people have moved in time because remember at that time, they thought that they were patting themselves on the back for doing something that was grand. We had just talked about this idea that, you know, back in the 1930s when Hattie McDaniel won her Oscar, you know, everyone stood up in applause and thought this was a good thing. We look back on it and we're like, well, you won an award for playing a subjugated individual with no power on screen, right? You know, is that a good thing necessarily, right? I mean, compared to, compared to, the, the 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 white heroine of the movie, right? You know, is there space and place for a black woman to be a, a you know a heroine as well, right? So in terms of just being equal in the mind. So we say this to say that when you look at our new logo, what we're looking to do is uh, take the same ideas and simply make them more accessible, right? Um, you know, because what we don't want is for fifty years from now, in the year twenty seventy three, for people to look back at the initiatives and protocols that we're developing now and say, well, um, you know, could you have maybe, you know, done more with that, right? And so I think um, while it can be difficult, it can be dark, it can be embarrassing, we want to embrace the history and not erase it, right? Because it allows for the history to shine a path on the light moving forward, right? And so when you look at what we've done with the Race and Reconciliation Initiative, um, uh, one, one uh, you know, piece I like to the 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 the, the share is that uh, we went uh, through a lot, okay, uh, especially in the very in the beginning because there was a lot of angst. I mean, again, we were talking about tensions nationally. We're uh, we're taught uh, with with friction over race, right? And talking about the George Floyd, and well, even though we think it was obvious, um, you know, there's still you know, debate and you know and discussion about as to what we should do. Um, you know, recognizing uh, a senseless death like that. And, and also just on our campus, you had COVID, right? And so there was a lot of angst. And so when we started off with this project, um, there was a lot of concern, whether it be from alumni, whether it be from staff, faculty, students, as to what we were doing, what was the purpose, right? What was the agenda? And even now, right? We're talking about in the state of Texas. Uh, what we're doing is unique because 
we are the private institution. And so uh, I don't know if you all know, but in the state of Texas, as of January 1st, there are no diversity, equity, and inclusion offices allowed in public institutions funded by state dollars, right? So what we're saying is that if you go to the University of Texas in Austin, there is no Office of Diversity and Inclusion where they have the specific task of promoting programs, fostering cultural connection. That doesn't exist now, right? So that, that's the type of environment where we're in, right? You know, we're in the state of Florida, where um, you know, people are still debating over how to frame African-American history in terms of the, the, the AP exam. Um, um, so in other words, we, we still are negotiating. We're, we're still having tensions over how to remember our past, right? And what we wanted to do and model was that we had three distinct voices that came together from different backgrounds and were able to not only come together as one in a collective voice, but also we were able to shine light and bring to the surface voices that had been largely overlooked for so long. I think the oral history was an absolutely integral and instrumental piece in capturing stories of people while they're still alive. And yes, it's legitimate, right? It's absolutely, they, they lived the experience. Who, who am I to tell them they didn't? You saw how touching it was to see Ron Hurdle, who's now an attorney, Talk about, I mean, just, just the emotions that came to him as the first black cheerleader. Can you imagine the first black cheerleader in Texas? I mean, uh, uh, you know, I mean, just in terms of just what he went through handling and touching white females, right? I mean, right, the, all, you know, and all, all that he went through. And, and this idea that I think it's important for students to see that this is not just a two word sentence, we integrated. These are real people. There's a lot of complication. There's a lot of emotions. And for us to be able to make these connections is absolutely powerful and important, right? And so um, I, what I wanted to say um, before uh, you know, uh, I went around that, that track was that um, by result of us telling our truth and telling our story, at the very beginning, even though there was a lot of angst and concern, I think what we've done is proven ourselves to be thought leaders. And what, what do I mean by that? Well, what I mean by that is that uh, the John W. Nason Award is handed out annually to um, you know, um, a select group of schools that show exemplary leadership right, with their board of trustees. And I'm, I'm pleased to share with you all that in 2023, uh, TCU was one of five schools elected nationally that was a recipient of the John W. Nason Award. And the reason, and you all can look it up, is they cited the board's leadership in commissioning the Race and Reconciliation Initiative. So in other words, we go from something that many people were concerned about to now being an award-winning enterprise that's a thought leader in the field, right? So, so it goes to show you, it pays to tell the truth. And yes, it was awkward. Yes, it was difficult at times. But again, I think what would be more awkward is if we ended up repeating some of these mistakes 50 years from now. That would be awkward indeed. So. I don't want to be too awkward and take up all the space. I want to make sure that we, um, you know, are able to hear some, some questions. So, Dr. Greensward, Mr. Perkins, anything that you would like to uh, say in conclusion before we open it up for Q and A? Uh, I wanted to speak a little bit to the oral history project. Uh, so, this is a collection of uh, interviews, recorded interviews. Those interviews are available on a database at the library. So there is a digital repository and uh, they're in the process of building the website, but several of those interviews are available as we speak. So I will put the link um, in the chat so that if you are curious and if you want to look into those interviews, you can. And uh, I'll just add briefly that uh, this is a, a work that is rooted in a love ethic. Um, th this is history. It is hard history. It's tough history. It is not always beautiful, perfect, or bright, uh, but in transparency comes true healing. And so that is what we wanted to offer with this work is that we provide all of the university in places that have been blind, have been overlooked, often excluded, just to serve up, to say, hey, these are the things that we've done, but here are the things we're willing to do moving forward. And so in that, uh, we, we, push our, we put ourselves in a very unique perspective or well, unique position to be, as Dr. G mentioned, thought leaders 
in this space. Uh, rarely do you have universities willing to dig deeply in their histories and their dark histories to say, this is how we handled our race relations in the past. However, comma, here is what we hope to be in the future. And so now that we have been transparent about it, we can now be actually held accountable to be who we said that we want to become. That's an excellent point. And, you know, and, and, and it goes to the point where there's enough material to sustain a book. And, and we hope you all will, uh, you know, take advantage of the opportunity to check it out. But it, so this is more than just a paragraph or mention or even a chapter. No, there's, there's a lot of material. Um, and I think that if more communities uh, simply took the time to, to dig and make that investment, they'll find that there's, there are plenty of stories to tell and share. So going to um, the, the Q&A, we, we can go ahead and, and get, get started and get open with this. I see Suzanne you know, wants to uh, uh, clarify what is the goal of the committee? And what would the end result of our work look like? Well, I'll, I'll just start off and say that the original goal was for the initiative to study TCU's relationship with slavery, racism, and the Confederacy. But I think the ultimate, ultimate goal was not to have an endpoint, but to continue starting conversations, right? You know, we, we wanted to create community by creating connection through conversation. Just the fact that we're talking about it, I think was just most important. So it's not a matter of, do we agree? Do we agree? Do we agree? It's not a matter of, are we all holding hands, walking down the street, singing Kumbaya, my Lord, Kumbaya, right? That's not the point. The point is, are we at least dialoguing, right? And, 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 and again, when we're talking about going into the archives, right? I'm not making this up. This is what they printed in the yearbook in 1921, right? This is what they printed in the school newspaper in 1955, right? I'm not making it up. So when we're having our discussion, our, our discussion is buttressed and supported and supplemented with nutritious facts, right? And so the idea is if you disagree about what the facts mean, you know, then, then we can have that discussion. But at the very least, we're doing our due diligence in, in finding the material that supports why we're saying what we're saying, right? When, when we when we when we offer the the uh, the reason that uh, you know opinion that well we still have some work to do, right? So so I think the end result um, is one that is constantly in in flux, Suzanne, right? Um, because hopefully this is a, a type of work that doesn't end, right? In terms of us having conversation and seeing how we can continuously learn. Right, um, you know. Again, we passed the laws. We we already said we 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 passed the policies and said we're integrated. Right. I mean, and even if you go on our website um, or any other website, you're going to see pictures where everyone's smiling, you know, sitting together. You know, everything's good. But if you also talk to students and talk to them about their day to day experiences, many will still reveal that the sense of belonging is is not something that is universal. Right, especially for students of color, right? Even though it's a, a high quality institution and no one's going out of their way to necessarily be mean to them, there's just this larger idea of belonging, right? And again, how is that cultivated? Well, if you walk, and again, I think Perkins, this would be a good time for you to talk about the portrait project, but if you walk in every building, right, complete with the columns and, and this old stone, and every time you see a, a portrait of this magnificent person, what, what is it telling you in the back of your head when you only, see white males, right? It's not to say those white males didn't contribute or do anything good for the university, but if that's the only image you see, right? Then you may not feel as if you belong in that space, right? Cumulatively over time. And, 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 and so along those lines, when we talk about the fruits of a project like this with the oral history project continuing to grow online, um, Ms. Perkins, uh, why don't you um, perhaps drop a little science about the uh, portrait project and, and what that means as connected to Greenswood's research on Charlie Thorpe. Absolutely, thank you, Dr. G. Um, so as mentioned earlier, I'm now the chair of the TCU Portrait Project. And what the goal of the Portrait Project is, is to diversify portraiture on campus. Uh, typically when you walk around uh, TCU or any university uh, that matter, there are portraits, large oil gold framed portraits. And typically they are of people who have donated significantly to the university, whether that's financially or through their scholarship, but mostly it is through financials or leadership, your college presidents or board of trustee members, but largely it is of white males. 
Now, this is not to say that their contributions aren't significant because without those, the university probably would struggle to exist. But with the Portrait Project, the, the idea and the goal is to find ways that other identities uh, such as Black, Hispanic, Native American, Asian, and women have also contributed significantly to the university that are not quantified in the ways of finances, uh, through time, energy, effort, scholarship, service. And so with this year's Portrait Project, the subject will be that of Charlie and Kate Thorpe, as mentioned by Dr. Greenswood, a formerly enslaved couple who once the university had its original setting in Thorpe Springs, Texas, moved to Waco, Texas, and into Fort Worth, Texas, where we are currently, they followed the university and they followed the founders to continue to help serve the university. And we know this to be true due to archival records, but also when Charlie died, Randolph Clark wrote extensively about how much he meant to the Clark brothers, how much he meant to the university, how much he meant to the local community. This man did everything but teach. And when we say that, we don't mean that to be dramatic. He was a firefighter, he was security, he cleaned, he protected, he nursed sick children, but yet couldn't get an education at TCU. Yet his children couldn't get an education at TCU. And so when we think about contributions, that in itself is a significant contribution. And so with the portrait project, uh, we will be building a portrait with, of Charlie and Kate Thorpe. But what is beautiful about this portrait is one, uh, I've been working closely with a local artist and I, I sometimes say a local I feel like I undersell her significance she is a nationally known artist um I would even say a global known artist in the art world she was the 2022 Texas State Artist of the Year she lives locally in the city of Fort Worth um working very closely with her um in her artistic style one of the the creative challenges that we've had is that we didn't have a picture to date of Charlie and Kate Thorpe a clear picture and so what is beautiful is that this artist works in silhouettes. And so I wish I could show you all this artistic style, but if you get a chance, her name is Miss Letitia Huckabee. Um, with these silhouettes, they usually have a nice floral background, a vibrant floral background, but obviously with silhouettes, it's like a shadow and it's very poetic because the way in which Charlie and Kate lived and worked was they were amongst the shadows. Despite the vibrancy, despite the life and love that they shared with each other, despite the service that they gave to the university, if we don't do this archival work, we don't know that they exist. And one thing that Dr. Greensward did, and, and uh, she didn't mention it, is that she found the living descendants of Charlie and Kate Thorpe. How often does that happen that a university can connect itself to enslavement and then further find the living, actual living descendants of these people? And so when we brought them to campus in 2021, for a lot of them, it was their first time meeting each other. We found branches of their family from the city of Dallas, New Mexico, Arizona. There were some also in the Midwest that couldn't attend. They came to campus where their great, great grandparents, once enslaved, when even free, became servants, worked on that campus. It was a history they never knew. So what we saw was healing in real time. And what the Portrait Project will provide is an ability to, one, work with local artists, work with descendant communities, and to tell the history of enslavement through art. And one last thing, bringing it back to the piece of artists working in silhouettes, she is using the great, great grandson and granddaughter of Charlie and Kate Thorpe to stand in for this portrait. And so I sat and I watched the process and I watched the emotions when they found out what this project meant and what it will look like. Who would have thought Charlie and Kate Thorpe, an informally enslaved couple, would have a portrait that is on the same level as of our college presidents, our board of trustee members, that will last a lifetime on that campus that they once worked on, underpaid, underacknowledged, that their great, great, great grandchildren will serve as standing in for them on that portrait that will last forever. And so when we talk about narrative shaping, counter storytelling, art can do that. And what we've done in the Race and Reconciliation Initiative and the Oral History Project and the, and the Portrait Project are pieces to the pie to show that we have many shades of purple and they des deserve to be seen, acknowledged, and celebrated. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope this is being recorded because, oh my goodness. No, seriously, I mean, no, I mean, Dr. Chris, who are, I mean, I, I mean, you want to jump in? Well, I mean, when Perkins frames it, I mean, you know, you can be a part of something but not see it. Well, Perkins, when you framed it like that, I was like, oh my God, how powerful is that? 
Dr. Greensward, I mean, that you were able to connect the past to the present, right? I mean, this individual who is virtually exploited and treated like he was enslaved and, and forgotten, overlooked, will now in perpetuity be at the same level as founders of this institution? Oh my God, what, what type of justice is this? How do you feel about being able to facilitate this? Yeah, it was a very emotionally charged moment when we were able to bring um, those descendants on campus. The uh, occasion is called Reconciliation Day. So once a year, the Race and Reconciliation Initiative has uh, a day where we come and we kind of meditate on what we have accomplished so far, we do that work of collective introspection, look at, um, you know, we have that report of what we, all, all the findings that the initiative has come up with. And so on that occasion, we actually brought the descendants of Charlie and Kate Thorpe on campus. And I had worked with that family for, you know, ever since I started at TCU. Uh, but they were just on paper. They were kind of a, you know, a name on, a family tree, they were a name on a record, they were, but having them come in the flesh, being able to see them, to see history come to life. Um, yeah, that was that was really powerful. And, um, you know, to this day, we're still in contact. Um, we text all the time. And, you know, we were really able to reconcile with that family. This was a relationship that had been uh, severe through times. As a matter of fact, when I actually picked up the phone and called uh, whoever I was able to find from that genealogy, one of the very first thing that always came back was, well, if my ancestor worked for TCU, how come we don't get any of that love back? How come TCU doesn't accept our own? And so having them come to campus being acknowledged by the chancellor, by the provost, members of the board of trustees were there. Uh, yeah, that was that was a history to remember. That's amazing. So I, I don't know if there's any other uh, questions out there in, in, in the audience. I mean, obviously we uh, are very excited about this, and um, you know, can talk about this all day. Um, but I mean, I, I think that hopefully this is signaling some of the possibilities that 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 can take place when when people are willing to to do the work and simply just tell the truth, right? You know, and again, that's that's one of the reasons why we wanted to to, to demonstrate that you know we're looking at stylizing the the old tradition um, in a new way, right? And so the 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 four uh, plumes represent you know the the, the four fountains. But, um, you know, so the idea is that there's this connection, uh, you know, to the past, but I mean, I think we have an opportunity on a daily basis to, to learn more and, and, and revitalize, you know, our interpretation, right? So with every day we can renew our understanding of yesterday. So I'm um, seeing how um, you know we're nearing the, the end of our scheduled hour. Now I don't see any questions, although everyone's been in attendance, which is awesome. Um, do either of you have any closing thoughts? Um, you know that, that maybe you'd like to share as far as just what this project means to you. Because I mean, uh, even though it's been published uh, in, in June, I mean the the feedback has been absolutely outstanding. I mean, I'm not trying to humble brag, but I mean we talk about the conferences that we've been to. Um, you know, the other book talks that we've done, um, you know, maybe y'all can share a little bit about just what it feels like to be on this end, because, you know, there, there were a lot of deadlines and <laughs> late nights and early mornings, uh, you know, to try to put this together, right? You know, and I know you all were rolling your eyes when an email from me came in the box about how we had to meet, right? <laughs> but, you know, but we're here on this end, right? And so, in conclusion, what, what is it like to um, taste? the fructose, the sweetness of the fruits of your labor? Um, it's a journey. It's a beautiful journey. Well, when you start a journey and you take one step at a time, you have an idea of where you want to go. You have a direction. You have a GPS and a map. But 
it is the things you see along that journey that you really take with you. It's the monuments, it's the, the flowers on the side of the road, it's the people that walk across you, it's the cars you see, it's the things that you come across and experience on the way to your destination. And then once you get to the destination and you finally got to take a, I made it safely, I made it on time, I made the deadline. And I think about the entire journey and I say, man, it was worth it. Every red light, every detour, every pothole that almost busts my tire, once I finally got to the destination, I can take a breath and say it was worth it. And so for me, uh, as uh, one of the uh, junior scholars uh, amongst these amazing individuals, uh, it was it was uh, a very um, insightful and very insightful experience on the art of the possible. What is truly possible when you collaborate with like-minded people, when you collaborate with community members, when you collaborate using art. Uh, we've used every medium you can think of, books, podcasts, oral histories, paintings, uh, informal, formal conversations, just to start the dialogue. As I said earlier, this is a love ethic. The ingredients of our love to this is truth, commitment, care, honesty, transparency. These are the ingredients of our love. And we take those things, we put it in one pot, and we take one step at a time in doing this work. The work of reconciliation is tiring, can be emotionally draining. It is rare, but once you get to the destination, you realize how rewarding it actually is. So that's that's what I have to share. I, I don't have much to add to, you said it all. Um, the one thing I would add is that it's very impressive to see the extent to which this project was really just the beginning and how much can be built upon this foundation. Um, we started this book knowing that we wanted to generate conversations. Um, and I'm just so happy that those conversations, they're still taking place. Um, whether the readers agree, disagree, um, I like especially the comments where we have a person that say, well, I was there and this is how I experienced it. Um, these are my favorite comments because I like to see the multifaceted aspect of history. Um, so again, we just, we're continuing the building process and I'm, I'm just glad that now we actually have a foundation. We can start the conversation. And we have something in writing, something that we can give to the next generations and say, here is history. History is still in the making, but this is where you came from. And along this idea of history in the making, in conclusion, I think what's a fun fact is that um, our book uh, is going to at least be around for 150 more years. And the reason why I say that is because this year we're celebrating our sesquicentennial, right? Say that five times fast. And so that means 150 years. We were founded in 1873. And so, right, it's 2024, but right, last year. So the idea is that um, our book was selected to be included in the time capsule that will be opened 150 years from now, right? So in so many ways, these small seeds can grow to be mighty oaks. They can, y'all. They can. And again, I, I just want to, in answer to Susan's question, I'll let you know that you can still stay connected to RRI. Uh, it is still ongoing. Um, you know, you can reach out to the, the chair and, and, and and figure out what projects are going on because there are multiple and and simply join the conversation because when we reflect back on our book i think arguably the most powerful part of all is that it wasn't the president or the chancellor or the provost that we're spending all of our time talking about no we're, we're talking about people just everyday people who had the power to make history. I believe those of you watching and listening share that same power. So may you continue to do the best you can with what you have. Thank you. Oh, thank you. I just can't thank the three of you enough for that informative and fascinating presentation. We really appreciate your taking the time to be with us tonight to share your knowledge and your experiences. So thank you again. 
And thank you to our attendees for joining us this evening. And again, as a reminder, Dr. Gooding will be leading a workshop this Saturday morning, 9 to 11 on Zoom. You can find more information about that and the registration details on the library's website at jocolibrary.org. And thank you all and have, enjoy the rest of your evening. <laughs>